Hey, this is Patrick Sullivan. I want a motorized drill press table. Now, let me be clear. Obviously, the bit is already driven by a motor. What I want now is for the table to drive itself up and down. Why? Well, why are cordless tools so popular? It's not because plugging in a cord is so much work. I have certainly been seduced by cordless tools for no reason other than just convenience. Apparently, my desire for convenience is bottomless. I want the table to move up and down with the mere push of a button. One finger power. Is there some easy, practical way for a fundamentally cheap man to add this luxury feature to his inexpensive press? Which, as you probably guessed, was never designed to be used this way. My machine came with a rack and pinion mechanism driven by a hand crank. This worked reasonably well when it was paired with the tiny cast iron table that came with the press. However, I do a lot more woodwork than metalwork, and I needed a much larger table. The bigger table blocked my easy access to the crank. I made a video about replacing the crank with a hand wheel, but its location at the back of the table was still awkward. If I remove the hand wheel and crank, you can see that the shaft of the pinion gear sticks straight out. I'm sure I can clamp a motor onto that shaft. But what would I attach the motor to? The obvious answer is the cast iron housing for the pinion gears. However, please note that there are no bolt holes and no flat surfaces other than this small flat directly under the shaft. Attaching a motor to this casting is not impossible, but they sure didn't make it easy. But wait, what about attaching the motor to the table itself? The same casting that holds the pinion mechanism also supports the table. If the table is shaped correctly and stiff enough and bolted firmly to the table support, then it ought to work. This strategy requires that the table extend back behind the fence far enough to create a space for the motor mount. Previously, I'd cut away that region to create clearance for the crank and hand wheel, so I also needed to build a new table. I've already solidly convinced myself that a single 18 millimeter or three quarter inch thick table is not nearly stiff enough in the size that I want. I elected to glue up three layers of half inch or 12 millimeter plywood. For the first layer, I removed the cast iron table and traced the outline. I didn't film it, but I also traced the diagonal cutouts. Then I cut out that outside shape with a saber saw, cutting as close to the line as I could. After a little rasp work, I managed to get a snug fit. I glued on the second layer and clamped it all around. After the glue had set, I turned the assembly over and marked for the bolt holes using the traced outline on the cutout from the first layer. I drilled those holes and countersunk the bolt tops. I used bolts with the low profile heads that we often use in T-tracks. The third layer of plywood captures the bolt heads between the layers. I don't want any steel penetrating through the top layer. This preserves my ability to route dovetail slots wherever I want to place clamps. The wood table extends behind the column of the drill press. The cutout is deep enough to give me ample space on the underside of the table for the motor mount. I cut off the two front corners so I wouldn't carelessly bump into them. Then I turned the table over and routed a recess to fit the box that holds the motor switch. I 3D printed the box and I probably should have made a template to guide the router for an exact fit but I got a reasonable result freehand. Once I dropped the wooden tabletop onto the small iron table and tightened the bolts, my new table effectively becomes an extension of the pinion gear housing. Okay, let's talk motors. What kind of motor do I need? The first motor question is, how fast should it go? After some experimentation, I found that one turn of the pinion shaft per second is a snail space. Five turns per second is pretty fast. For small corrections, I might overshoot my mark. I think the right answer, if the speed is fixed, is around three turns per second. 
In motor language, that's 180 RPMs. How powerful should it be? Well, if you're just moving the original small table up and down, a small motor will probably work. However, I want to put a large solid table on it, and then I often want to put a steel vise on top to hold the work perfectly square and rigid. Add in the weight of the workpiece, and now we might need a motor with more power. Since I'm not very electronically sophisticated, I settled for a simple brushed DC motor with a worm drive that I bought from Amazon. It draws 80 watts, which theoretically translates to one-tenth of a horsepower. I just guessed at the power I needed, but my guess turned out to work. The built-in worm gears reduced the motor speed to 160 RPMs. The maker offered several speed choices, but 160 was the only one in my speed range that was in stock, so I took it. This motor just needs a 24-volt power supply and a momentary switch. I didn't have to program a microprocessor or sign up for an electronics course. The simplicity was very seductive. The next problem is to figure out how to attach the motor. Its output shaft has to align with the pinion shaft. The mount needs to be strong and fairly rigid, but also needs to slide side to side to connect and disconnect with the pinion. I bought a short length of L-shaped 6061 aluminum that's 75 millimeters or 3 inches on each side. It's a quarter inch thick, that's a little over 6 millimeters, and that seems to be stiff enough to handle the motor torque and weight. I cut slots to allow it to slide back and forth. The aluminum bracket sits on a plywood spacer. The plywood spacer has slots for the mounting bolts so it can move at right angles to the aluminum bracket. Between the two adjustments, I should be able to get a correct alignment. I measured for the thickness of the spacer as accurately as I could, but for fine tuning, I added wooden shims and strips of aluminum cut from a Coke can. How will the two shafts connect? The pinion shaft is 14 millimeters, and the output shaft on the motor is 10 millimeters. I don't have a metal lathe to turn a solid connector, but fortunately, I could buy one online in exactly the right size at a very reasonable price. The connector I bought is called a plumb connector, and don't ask me why. It has a big advantage over rigid couplings in that it can handle small misalignments. Small misalignments seem to follow me around. Even if I do a perfect job of aligning the parts now, the fact that this is an assembly of wood and metal parts practically guarantees some future minor misalignment due to wood movement or wear or maybe just bad karma. The connector needed two customizations. First, the motor shaft has a raised key, so I had to cut a keyway in the connector. This keyway is very small, but fortunately I had a needle file with an appropriate shape. Curiously, the connector is made of aluminum, but it's evidently forged from a tempered aircraft grade like 7075, because it files much more slowly than the usual aluminum I use. The second modification is that there's a flat on the pinion gear shaft. The original crank held onto the shaft with a set screw. I drilled a hole in the connector and threaded it for an M4 set screw to lock it into place. The red part is called a spider. It's a hard but resilient polyurethane and is intended to absorb any misalignment and also cushion the abrupt impact when the motor turns on. After bolting the table firmly to the original cast iron table, I clamped the motor mount to the table and put half the coupling on the pinion shaft and half on the motor shaft. At this point, it's obviously out of line vertically and requires some shims. The three parts of the coupling are a very snug fit, and so they need to be coaxed into position. Here are the parts in operation. Like many other drill presses, the rack is not bolted to the column. It sits loose, captured at both ends by rings that allow it to rotate around the column. I don't like this feature. The table tries to rotate every time the height is adjusted. This can easily result in misaligned holes. I hate misaligned holes. To minimize this, I clamped the rack to the column 
with stainless steel hose clamps. I printed alignment rings, which I used under the clamps to eliminate any side-to-side -side movement. These were easy to make and they seemed to work like a charm. The clamps can be easily removed if needed. The only tricky part of the wiring is the switch. The easiest and most convenient way to get instant reversibility is to use a double pole, double throw momentary switch. This baby has six connections. It has been a long time since I wired one of these, so I needed a quick review. The two wires from the power supply go to the middle pair of terminals. The two wires from the motor go to either of the end terminal pairs. The motor sits right here on the drill press, where a clockwise rotation raises the table. Then, two jumpers are soldered into place. Each runs diagonally from one corner terminal to the other terminal, which is diagonally opposite. When the switch is pressed in the up direction, the current runs this way, and the motor turns clockwise. When the switch is pressed in the other direction, the current follows this path, which travels through the motor in the opposite direction. This reverses the motor. Whoever thought this up was clever. One switch allows you to change the direction almost instantly. I printed a very small box to house the switch and recessed it into the table edge. This is low voltage electricity, so a box is not strictly necessary, but it's neater and it protects the connections. The wires uh, also need some protection and management, so I printed a couple of simple wire guides. Does it work? Yes. You can see that it goes up and down. The speed is reasonable. You have excellent control and can easily make fine adjustments in the height. If you need to move the table all the way up or down, a little more speed would be nice. However, it's still much faster than doing it the old way by hand. In my limited knowledge of motors, I'm pretty sure that the speed of a DC motor is directly related to the voltage. If I install the power supply with variable voltage, I could probably speed up this motor. The motor is rated for 24 volts, and if I ran it for an hour at 40 volts, it might seriously overheat. But in fact, it only runs for a few seconds at a time. Even if the heat production is doubled, I doubt that that would create a problem. There is another issue I should have foreseen. When the pinion housing is unclamped from the column, the weight of this big table causes it to tilt downward just a little. This racking force can make it bind, which is coincidentally exactly the way that a bar clamp works. When it binds, the motor tries to draw more current. The power supply I bought has a protection circuit built in, which shuts off the power when the amperage surges. This can be easily reversed by just toggling the switch, so it's not a big problem once you grasp what's going on. It can also be prevented by providing a little lift at the front edge of the table with your free hand. One finger usually does the job. Interestingly, the gearing in the motor makes it extremely difficult for the pinion shaft to rotate when the motor is on. The unclamped table will not move downward except under massive loads. This effectively means that it's often not critical to lock up the column clamp. Would I do it again? In a heartbeat. It's hard to put into words, but the press seems much more, well, convenient. Using it seems easier. As I change bits, I want to adjust the table height to the optimum position rather than using some compromised position with scraps of MDF under the work to get nearer to the end of the bit. It's easy to set the table height so your work surface is just a few millimeters below the drill bit. This makes it easier to line up holes. It also ensures that you will have the full depth of the quill when you need deep holes. It's a luxury feature at a modest price. And it was fun to build too. As always, thanks for watching.